Kabbalah is one of the most widely practiced forms of mysticism. Followers believe that decoding its ancient texts will reveal the answers to the greatest mysteries of life. In the 21st century, celebrities including Madonna and Britney Spears have taken up a modern interpretation of the practice. Yet the spread of Kabbalah has sparked controversy. Strict adherents warn that this mystical practice holds hidden perils. Throughout history, followers have coded their writings to protect Kabbalah's secrets. How many levels of understanding are there? Maybe infinite. So the more you have to decode the past, to decode the text, the more mystical it is, the harder it is to decode. In Babylon, at the beginning of the 6th century BCE, a young Israelite named Ezekiel has a vision. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and fire flashing forth continually. And in the midst of the fire, there was a throne. Sitting on the throne was a figure that looked like a man. Ezekiel believes he has peered into heaven and seen God seated on his throne. This vision captivates a group of Jewish mystics. They hope that by studying this image, they will one day see God for themselves and become one with the divine spirit. Jews who are seeking a mystical experience will try to reimagine what Ezekiel experienced. So it becomes the model for Jewish mystical ascent, really until the emergence of Kabbalah. In the second century CE, the Roman Empire controls what is now Israel. Jews who practice their faith openly are either killed or forced into exile. It is during this time that many Jews turn to mysticism to help them understand God's will. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is one of the men searching for answers. Rabbi Shimon uh, was a great advocate of the people of Israel and taught that uh, Israel has a special intimacy with God. And he fled from the Romans who sought to execute him because of anti-Roman statements he had made. According to Jewish texts, Bar Yochai hides from the Romans for 13 years in this cave in Pekayin, Israel. Here, Bar Yochai meditates on God and the universe using the Torah, or Hebrew scriptures, as his guide. His unique methods and devout practice make him one of the first key figures in Kabbalah's history. Like Bar Yochai, other small groups of Jewish mystics begin trying to achieve a greater understanding of God. Since God wasn't coming to them, they were going to where, to where God was. So they wanted some kind of experience of the divine. They used certain meditative techniques that worked them up into an auto-suggestive hypnotic trance. Their activities are kept hidden. The mystics warn that this practice is too dangerous for average people to attempt. Ancient legends tell of novices being driven mad or even dying because they were unprepared for the powerful spiritual forces they had unleashed. If you're not pure enough, if you're not modest enough, then God might not accept you, then God might not let you go through that journey. Through meditation, the mystics believe they have achieved a vision of God like the one experienced by the prophet Ezekiel. In this vision, the entrance to heaven is blocked by a series of gates. The mystics must pass through them before reaching God. The entrances are also guarded by menacing angels who keep the unworthy from heaven. Before the mystics can advance, they have to learn the complicated names of the angels. Each name must then be repeated an exact number of times. The mystics would wear amulets that would shield them from the power of the angels. And if they went through all the gates and they got into the throne room, then they would have this vision. They would learn the secrets 
The mystics claim those secrets help them understand God's thoughts. At roughly the same time, unknown mystics recorded a startling concept into an influential book. The text is called the Book of Creation, or the Sefer Yetzirah. It describes how God made the world by using the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. God spoke and said, let there be light. So obviously God's speech was the creating agent. Well, what language did God speak? God spoke Hebrew, of course. So the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet were the alphabet of creation. What Sefer Yitzhira does is to try to describe how God created the world in more detail than we find in Genesis. It builds on the notion that God created the world through language, but now it's not words so much as individual letters. And this is probably meant rather literally. God took the three letters Aleph, Bet, Nun, which spelled the word Evan, stone. By combining those letters, a stone was created. And similarly with every object in the universe, God created by combining the letters with the numbers. Rabbis believe the teaching of the Sefer Yetzirah are too powerful for ordinary people to experience, and the details of the book are kept hidden. These mystical revelations remain underground for hundreds of years. In the 11th century, the Crusades begin a new wave of anti-Jewish persecution as Christian armies try to reclaim the Holy Land from the Arabs. Fleeing from torture and execution, Jews scatter across Europe and the Middle East, taking their secret traditions into new territories. By the 13th century, the mystical teachings have spread to Jewish communities in what are now Germany, France, and Spain. The term Kabbalah, meaning receiving in Hebrew, now becomes widely used to describe the practice. We're really talking about a small group of, of Jewish teachers, rabbis, spiritual people who were gathering the earlier traditions, developing techniques of meditation, and reimagining God in some very startling ways. One of the most significant events in Kabbalah's history occurs around 1280, when a Spanish rabbi claims to discover yet another mysterious text. This will soon become the single most important book in Kabbalah. It is called the Zohar, meaning radiance or splendor in Hebrew. It's really the masterpiece of Kabbalah. The ideas of the Zohar are very radical and very startling. Written mainly in Aramaic, its pages are filled with arcane symbolism and erotic language. By arousal below, there is similarly arousal above. Male and female unite, desire prevails, worlds are blessed, and above and below are in joy. To this day, the author of the Zohar remains a mystery. Many Kabbalists believe that Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai received divine inspiration to write the Zohar while living in a cave during the second century. Others suspect that the manuscript was written a thousand years later, possibly by a Spanish Kabbalist or even by a group of rabbis. It's in a way written by someone in Aramaic who didn't really know Aramaic that well. And you also strangely find words in medieval Portuguese and Spanish in the Zohar. So the question scholars have been wrestling with for a couple of hundred years now is, who wrote it and how did it come to be? But the greatest mystery of the Zohar lies within its mystical text. You have to work so hard to decipher it. And this is why it's so attractive, because of this beautiful game it plays with you uh, of revealing and hiding. Decoding these complicated passages promises a greater understanding of God and his relationship with humans. 
the Zohar really sees the Bible as a secret code. Every event in the Zohar, every bit of narrative, every biblical law, is telling something not only about what happens on Earth, but about God's inner being. Kabbalists believe that if they can successfully decode the Zohar, they will unlock the mysteries of both heaven and Earth. One of these secrets is a startling revelation about God's body and sexuality. By the 13th century, Kabbalah had spread throughout Europe and the Middle East. Yet even as the number of Jews studying Kabbalah grew, their secrets remained closely guarded. Ever since, scholars have been searching for ways to unravel these secrets. In Berkeley, California, Daniel Matt works surrounded by these copies of the Zohar, the most revered and mysterious manuscript in Kabbalah. His bookcase is filled with versions and commentaries in Aramaic, Hebrew, English, and French. They come from libraries around the world. He hopes to complete the first English translation of the Zohar based on original Aramaic texts. This ambitious work is the latest attempt to understand a book that has perplexed scholars for over 700 years. I don't want to ruin the mystery or the, the strange cryptic quality of the Zohar, but I'm trying to make it accessible to a contemporary reader. The Zohar is perhaps the most difficult Jewish text to translate. Most of its roughly 2,000 pages are in Aramaic, an arcane language that may have been used to further complicate the decoding process. On the surface, the Zohar is a novel which follows Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and a group of rabbis on a journey through what is now Israel. They wander through the hills of Galilee, sharing their secret teachings, sometimes running into strange characters on the road. Kabbalists believe that the narrative holds clues that can explain hidden meanings in the Torah or Hebrew scriptures. Several examples can be found by re-examining the book of Genesis. Here, the Zohar overturns the traditional account that God expelled Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. The Zohar's interpretation illustrates a revolutionary belief that humans can direct God. But the Zohar asks a very radical question. It says, who kicked whom out of the garden? And the Zohar actually teaches Adam expelled God from the garden. It's as if we're still in the garden but we don't realize it because we've, we've expelled God. We, we've lost touch with a spiritual dimension. And the challenge is to regain some awareness, some intimacy with the divine. The further Kabbalists delve into the Zohar, the more cryptic the words become. It has a very sim uh, rich symbolic system. This is a deliberated means to uh, keep the Zohar for the elite only. The writers probably thought that only those who are spiritual enough will be able to decipher it. The major symbolic code found in the Zohar is the 10 aspects of God's personality, the 10 Sifirot. One popular interpretation shows these characteristics as a map of God's body. Kabbalists believe that if they can understand God's anatomy, they can learn how his powers work. These ancient drawings reveal that God's body is similar to humans. The top symbolizes God's head, which is the source of will, wisdom, and understanding. Below that are symmetrically arranged organs and limbs, representing love, power, beauty, eternity, and splendor. The most unusual part of the diagram contains sensual imagery. The ninth part of God, called the foundation, is the phallus, 
or procreative life force of the universe. But according to the Sifirot, God also has female components. The final element, often called Shekinah, was depicted as the feminine half of God. This image challenged the age-old view of a strictly masculine God. What we find for the first time is that this feminine aspect, the feminine consort of God, is divine and is part of the divinity. So to unite the male and female halves of God, this becomes the goal of the whole system of the Sefirot. And the Zohar describes that union in very graphic terms. There really is a romance within God and a, a sexual union, and that's a striking element of, of the Zohar, probably led to its, to its wide appeal in some ways. This complicated system supported the Kabbalist teaching that humans affect God. Students of the Zohar believe that human actions unite these masculine and feminine parts of God. How are the two halves of God united? Through human virtue, through loving one's neighbor, through helping the poor, through observing the Sabbath, through various interpersonal and ritual commandments, one brings together these two halves of God. You might say that this is how we actualize the divine potential in the world. The idea that God is dependent on human beings clashed with traditional beliefs that saw God as an omnipotent ruler. We, and this is, I think, an extraordinary idea of the Kabbalists, we have the ability, through the performance of sacred deeds, to nurture God, to influence God, to affect God, to be able to affect the divine disposition, which then will affect the flow down of divine grace to our world. But in this relationship, human sins create imbalance. In this case, human misdeeds, human unethical conduct, human evil empowers the cosmic evil, or somehow ruins the harmony within God and stimulates evil in the universe. Another revolutionary idea encrypted in the Zohar is that even a seemingly insignificant verse in the Hebrew scriptures can reveal how God feels and acts. In the Zohar, they read the Bible not only as a story about human beings, what's going on in human affairs, but they also read it on a mystical level as a story about what's going on within the inner life of God. According to the Zohar, biblical characters are often metaphors for God's thoughts and actions. The quality of loving kindness, for instance, came to be associated with Abraham in the Bible. So every reference to Abraham doing something was actually viewed as a reference to the role of loving kindness in the world. The Zohar also examines biblical events for hidden meanings. The flood, according to Kabbalah, is happening now. If you don't know that the flood is still going on, then you're drowning and you don't even know it. So various symbols of chaos and destruction from the Bible were also viewed, not in the past tense, but as still unfolding. While mystics continued to explore the mysteries of the Zohar, another 13th century Spanish Kabbalist was devising a new method for uniting with God. Abraham Abu Lafia's technique involved intense meditation and yoga-like movements. His followers would use certain hand and head movements to concentrate on the Bible's Hebrew letters. The most ancient idea is that God has multiple names, and these names have power. Abu Lafia wanted to have a reading of the Bible according to which the entire Bible speaks solely about God. 
by transforming the normal Hebrew nouns and verbs into divine names. One of the divine names Abu Lafia used was the 72-letter name taken from three verses in Exodus. When the letters in the verses were combined according to Abu Lafia's instructions, they spelled one of God's secret names. Through intense meditation on these letters, Abu Lafia believed the human mind and God's mind would then unite. Some Kabbalists claim that Moses meditated on this name in order to part the Red Sea. At the height of the Spanish Inquisition, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella declared that all Jews must either convert to Christianity or be expelled. During 1492, over 100,000 Jews fled Spain. Once again, religious persecution influenced the spread of Kabbalah's teachings. A century later, many Kabbalists would use their techniques to call forth the promised Messiah. In 1492, the Spanish Inquisition cast tens of thousands of Jews into exile. Many fled to the Holy Land. Ninety miles north of Jerusalem, in the Galilee region, Jewish mystics known as Kabbalists settled in the town of Safed. A number of Kabbalists were attracted to Galilee, partly because Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the hero of the Zohar, had wandered around the Galilee. Today, the dusty, winding roads of Safed are peopled by artists and lined with galleries. Five centuries ago, however, Kabbalists believed that the Messiah would one day walk these same streets. One of the scriptures, it is being said that the Messiah, when the Messiah will come to Jerusalem, he will first appear in the Galilee. So they sort of want to be the first ones to catch him. The mystical text known as the Zohar taught that good behavior increased God's powers on earth. Based on this philosophy, Kabbalists hoped that a life of holiness would bring forth the Messiah. Kabbalists in Safed strove to become a perfect religious society. The feeling was that uh, people have to help God bring the Messiah. They have to be pure enough. They would be up at midnight to say the prayers begin at dawn to pray with the rising of the sun. Kabbalah masters in Safed instructed their followers to engage in meticulous meditation, fasts, and adherence to the Torah. The most famous leader was Rabbi Isaac Luria from Jerusalem. By the time Luria began teaching in Safed in 1570, he was regarded as one of the most important holy men of the century. As a young man, Luria had spent several years in seclusion near Cairo, Egypt. There, Kabbalists say, Luria studied the Zohar and had visions of angels and biblical prophets. There's some evidence that he used the Zohar as sort of a, a mantra, that he would take passages of the Zohar and repeat it over and over again until he got deep inside it. In this trance-like state, Luria acquired extraordinary abilities. Rabbi Isaac Luria, he could look at a person's forehead and read everything about, about that person, S somewhat like reading the, the palm. He was a healer. He could tell people's past lives and what has to, to be fixed. 
Luria believed that understanding a person's prior life would provide insight into their current problems. He taught a theory of reincarnation in which he claimed that every individual is descended from a certain soul root after Adam and Eve. You're descended from either Cain or Abel, or you're descended from the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So you have at least five options, if not more, of a basic soul root, and that soul root determines your essential nature. With Luria's help, many Kabbalists searched for links to their past. These burial sites around Safed took on an important role as Kabbalists tried to find the graves of their previous incarnations. They would take on the soul of the deceased who was lying there and speak with that person's voice. To this day, gravesite rituals and pilgrimages continue around Safed. Here, followers gather at the tomb of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Some are practicing Luria's teachings. One of Luria's main contributions to Kabbalah was a new concept of creation. The world only exists because God needed somebody to relate to, implying that God has some need for love, for relationship. Luria taught that the first act was not creation, but actually a withdrawal. God withdrew, you might say, in all directions from one central point, creating a kind of vacuum, an empty spot within God. According to Luria, the emptiness gave God room to create the world. God placed vessels in the void and began filling them with divine light, shattering several of the vessels. In this case, the creation of the world and catastrophe are tied together. You can't have creativity without destruction at the same time. Luria explained that sparks from the shattered vessels fell to earth. Everything God created contained one of these divine sparks. According to Luria, humans can reunite these fragments of divine spirit with God through good works. Our deeds can repair the upper world. And when all of those sparks are restored, then you have messianic redemption. In 1572, when Isaac Luria died of the plague, many Kabbalists feared his death was a punishment for revealing forbidden secrets. It's a blow to the expectations of redemption. After it suffered, sort of fades away gradually until the, the end of the century. The invention of the printing press would soon spread Kabbalah's teachings like never before. By the time of Luria's death, bound copies of the Zohar, as well as manuscripts written in Safed, were available to the public. Kabbalah seemed to have finally come out of hiding. By the 16th century, Kabbalah's mystical ideas had reached much of the Jewish world. Followers practiced throughout Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. In the coming century, Kabbalah would spread like religious wildfire, but in the wrong hands, its teachings would have disastrous repercussions. The 16th century was marked by the unprecedented spread of the Jewish mysticism known as Kabbalah. It began when the Zohar and other mystical works were translated into Latin. 
Christian philosophers were eager to study Kabbalah and believed it could help solve the mysteries of their own faith. They're very much interested in Kabbalah, especially as the Zohar is perceived as a text that was written more or less in that period of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Hence, they assume that there is an uncontaminated, pure Judaism of the time of Christ, which uh, entails the truths of Christianity. This belief was the foundation of what is often called Christian Kabbalah. Renaissance thinkers also used Kabbalah to understand the works of Pythagoras and Plato, whose philosophies mirrored aspects of Jewish mysticism. Some scholars claim philosopher Gottfried Leibniz, who invented calculus, and even Isaac Newton studied Kabbalistic ideas. I wouldn't assume that modern uh, science is based on, uh, on Kabbalah, but certainly the people who created modern science and modern philosophy, there was an interest in Kabbalah. Meanwhile, Kabbalah was also being studied by two men who would unknowingly spark one of the greatest catastrophes in Kabbalah's history. Shabbatai V was born in what is now Izmir, Turkey in 1626. As a young man, V suffered from recurring nightmares about demonic attacks and turned to the Zohar for answers. Shabbatai Tzvi was apparently a very gifted but very troubled young man who had reached a crisis by the age of 40. Scholars now believe Zvi experienced alternating states of deep depression and manic euphoria. The climax came when he staged a mock marriage between himself and a Torah scroll. It was the nature of his affliction to periodically violate the commandments publicly and be thrown out of a community on a wave of scandal. Banished by several Jewish communities in the Ottoman Empire, Zvi fled to Jerusalem, where he wandered through the streets reciting Kabbalistic chants. In 1665, Zvi met Nathan of Gaza, a young man studying Kabbalah. The two spent several weeks together traveling through what is now Israel, In time, Nathan became convinced that Zvi was the Messiah. Nathan proclaimed that the Messiah had appeared. The good news traveled from synagogue to synagogue in the Ottoman Empire and then in Europe. By 1666, the entire Jewish world was captivated by the coming of the Messiah. Shantai Tzvi was a manic depressive, and, <laughs> but a very charismatic manic depressive. And, uh, and a lot of people gathered around him. But, uh, you know, other people felt that you know, the time was ripe. In fact, this might be what we've been waiting for. In early 1666, Ottoman soldiers arrested Zvi and brought him to the Sultan's palace in what is now Turkey. The Sultan sentenced V to death for creating a public frenzy. The Turkish Sultan gave him a, an offer you can't refuse, namely convert to Islam or I'll cut your head off because if you are the Messiah and I cut your head off, you'll be able to put it back. Now, if Shabtat Zvi had been willing to have been martyred, uh, this might have created another phenomenon such as Jesus. Here's the Messiah dying for his faith. But Shabtat Zvi took the easy way out and converted to Islam. When Zvi emerged from the palace a Muslim, a handful of supporters followed his example and converted to Islam. But the vast majority of Jews were outraged. Jews accused Kabbalists of heresy and blamed Kabbalah for leading them astray. I would say that one of the major effects he had was convincing people that mysticism was bad stuff, that mysticism was dangerous, that mysticism led to all kinds of uh, terrible things. It's at that point that you have uh, the restrictions really put into place 
more more severely about who should study Kabbalah and how widely it, it could be spread. A few Kabbalistic circles continued to thrive in Eastern Europe, including a group whose practice became known as Hasidism. A rabbi and mystic called the Baal Shem Tov, or Master of the Good Name, became the leader of the Hasidic movement at the beginning of the 18th century. The Baal Shem Tov unified other mystical circles who were operating under the radar, as it were. While early Kabbalah had been reserved for a select few, Hasidism took elements of Kabbalah and made them accessible to ordinary people. Contrary to the strict meditation and study of early Kabbalah, Hasidism emphasized celebrating God in everyday life. Hasidism also encouraged a more open exchange of Kabbalistic ideas. There's a democratic impulse in Hasidism. Anyone can serve God, anyone is beloved of God, if one discovers the spark. So this idea of the hidden sparks, which had appeared in Kabbalah, now it becomes a technique of, of finding God in the world. While the larger Jewish population continued to shun mysticism, Hasidic Jews preserved Kabbalah's traditions throughout the 1800s. Today, Kabbalah has taken on an entirely new appearance in the City of Angels. Some scholars believe this trend is precisely what early practitioners had feared most, that Kabbalah would fall into the hands of the spiritually unprepared. Kabbalah achieved widespread popularity for the first time in the late 1600s. But when the mystical practice became linked to a false messiah, Kabbalists across Europe and the Middle East were shunned. For the next 250 years, Kabbalah remained in the shadows of Jewish life. In the 1930s, a German historian named Gershom Scholem began to rediscover the teachings of Jewish mysticism. He spent many, many years traveling through the libraries of Europe and cataloging and reading these manuscripts, some of which had simply not been opened for decades or, or in some cases, centuries. You could say that he made this material accessible to the Western world. As Hitler's Third Reich spread terror throughout Europe, Jews found themselves struggling to understand the persecution, torture, and murder faced by their people. Kabbalah's belief that evil deeds could throw the universe out of balance was tragically underscored by the Holocaust. With over six million Jews killed, the world had reached one of its darkest hours. Yet Jews and Kabbalists were also hopeful that the world could be repaired. At times of crisis, at times of suffering, when people are trying to satisfy their own need for order and meaning and fulfillment, mysticism can provide some of the answer to that. In the 1960s, the American counterculture explored new approaches to religion. One of those spiritual seekers was Philip Berg, a rabbi from New York. In the late 1960s, Berg traveled to Israel, where he delved into Kabbalah's teachings. Berg soon devoted himself to studying the ancient practice. His goal was to share Kabbalah with the masses. He reshapes it by presenting in it a way that someone who's not versed in, in Kabbalistic text and, and doesn't know much even about Judaism can understand these ideas and apply them for his way of life. Berg's simplified interpretation of Kabbalah spread quickly. At the beginning of the 1970s, Berg opened his first Kabbalah center in Tel Aviv. During the 1980s, 
Philip Berg and his family constructed a Kabbalah empire based here in Los Angeles. Today, what is known as the Kabbalah Center has several million followers and operates branches in nearly 100 cities, making it the largest Kabbalistic organization in the world. Here at the LA headquarters, Kabbalah has caught the attention of celebrities seeking a spiritual dimension to their lives. Berg's two sons help promote the concept that unlike the restricted Kabbalah of the past, this practice is open to all. We offer Kabbalah for everyone, without any barriers, race, sex, religion, anything. So we're very uh, excited about the opportunity of bringing this wisdom, which has been hidden, to, to the masses by making it accessible, understandable, and practical. By opening the doors to everyone, the Kabbalah Center has opened itself to harsh criticism. You have all of these Hollywood people um, jumping on the Kabbalah bandwagon, but many of them are not Jews and they're not observing Jewish law. Whether they're studying the real Kabbalah, I doubt it. They tend to say, here's a sacred name, here's a sacred practice, that will bequeath to you some Kabbalistic power. The Kabbalah Center emphasizes ancient practices such as meditating on the 72 names of God and making pilgrimages to Kabbalist sites in Israel, like Madonna did in 2004. A pop star called Madonna adopting Kabbalah. I think this is, in a nutshell, this is postmodern cult spirituality for you. It's really a, a match made in heaven between Kabbalah Center and Madonna. Wearing religious objects is also popular, such as tying a red string around the wrist to ward off evil forces. The practical Kabbalah, the world of amulets as it is today, is an aspect that they can touch, that they can read, that they can feel, that's physical. And these are all things uh, for which theoretical Kabbalah doesn't touch them, doesn't reach them. New Kabbalah is study Kabbalah not in order to understand the universe, the secrets of the universe, but in order to find a practical way of make, making your life better. Decoding Kabbalah has been a complex mystical journey for thousands of years, and the quest to control its secrets continues to this day. I think there is a struggle of possession of Kabbalistic knowledge, who's in the possession of interpreting it and explaining its worth and significance to the modern world. Okay, you can have a thought and that can connect you to God. That, that's what Kabbalah is about. This true, serious, deep study of Kabbalah is going on and will continue. I'm sure that a lot of them who are not, the not sincere ones will you know, simply drop out sooner or later. Many followers say that even with absolute dedication, it is impossible to discover all the hidden meanings within Kabbalah. But there's another whole level that the Kabbalists have. There's so many layers and levels of Kabbalah that it, you could take your whole life and you're still not going to finish learning the universe of Kabbalah. This ancient mystical wisdom will no doubt continue to reveal new mysteries to the modern world. People search for new techniques and means and paths to make their lives spiritual. So I think as long as there will be humanity, there will be mysticism. It's something very ancient and something very immediate and contemporary at the same time. And I think that's what makes Kabbalah so intriguing, is that it, it's both new and ancient. This questioning, why are we here in the world? This questioning about the nature of God. And Kabbalah does promote and try to answer those questions.
The entire oral tradition uh, was not written down. Um, the oral tradition was given to Moses at the same time that he was given the tablets and given the written Torah, the five books of Moses. Uh, he was also given an oral tradition at that time. And that was also handed down for many, many centuries. In fact, until the second century, uh, it was handed down. And then um, it was written, it was handed down orally with people making notes and things like that, but there was no formal uh, written oral tradition. But because of the persecutions they were suffering under the Romans and uh, the fear that much of the oral tradition was going to be lost, so some of the sages under the leadership and guidance of Rabbi Judah the Prince, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, wrote down the Mishnah, which is the uh, basic kernel of the Talmud. And um, at the same time, more or less, the Kabbalah was written down in the form of the Zohar and uh, several other Kabbalistic works as well at the same time, more or less, uh, more or less at the same time. Kabbalah, as I said, means Jewish mysticism. It's important not only to put the accent on mysticism, it's important to put the accent also on Jewish. In other words, that Kabbalah is a mystical tradition coming out of Judaism and therefore is an inextricable part of the Jewish religious tradition, meaning its theology, its laws, its rituals, its holiday observances, and you cannot detach Kabbalah from Judaism. It would be like having a premise without a conclusion, which is a fallacy. And I say this because many people today are maintaining, and you see advertisements for courses today in Kabbalah, where they say, well, this has nothing to do with Judaism. It's impossible to have Jewish mysticism without Judaism. So Kabbalah is the mystical tradition of Judaism. This goes back to the whole issue raised by the Sefer Yetzirah and other forms of Jewish cosmology, how the world came into being. In other cultures, you had a variety of ideas, let's say in mythologies, of how the world came into being through a fight between the gods, through the death of a god and using the body to be the basis for the world or for human beings or something like this. Uh, you have legends about the world coming from a hatched primordial egg. You have all kinds of legends. In Jewish tradition, you have a kind of, I would say, unique view. And that is that the key to creation is language. That language brought about the creation. After all, in the biblical story of creation, we read, God said, Let it, I want to create this, and there it was. So the idea was that the world was created through the use of language, particularly the Hebrew language. So therefore, if you could master the permutations of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, particularly the permutation of the letters of certain words in the Hebrew alphabet, like the ineffable name of God, called in fancy language the Tetragrammaton, then you could undertake creative activities of your own. And one example of this that comes out of the Sefer Yetzirah, it's found in the commentaries of the Sefer Yetzirah, not in the book itself, is a, an idea that floats through the history of Jewish mysticism, is found in many novels today even, and that is the idea of the, what's called the golem, namely the creation of artificial life through the manipulation of certain letters of the Hebrew alphabet as the key to creation. Now, if this idea sounds very outlandish, consider, if you will, how we look at the new discoveries about genomics. The genome is presented as being represented, the four nucleotides of which we're all composed are represented by four letters, G-A-T-C, and the combination, recombination of those letters leads us to knowledge, hopefully, of how to cure disease and even how to create life. This is essentially the exact same idea as you find in the commentaries to the Sefer Yitzhira and in certain 
uh, Jewish mystical texts. So the idea was that, yes, the Sefer Yitzhira was used uh, to create things if you mastered the techniques that the commentaries explain as being implicit within this very short treatise, the Book of Formation or the Sefer Yitzhira. Magic plays a big role in Jewish magic and Jewish superstition, um, and Jewish mysticism and Jewish superstition. Today, a lot of these ideas sound very quaint to us, but I would suggest that we look at them another way than we usually do. Rather than simply look at them as superstition, look at them first as a kind of science of the day. In other words, they use, let's say, certain potions and certain charms and certain uh, behavior because it worked in the past. So it was the kind of science of the day. They didn't have the technology we did, but they knew that if you did certain things, certain other things weren't going to happen, usually certain bad things. Secondly, they viewed the world as being populated by demons, by malevolent, invisible forces. Now, this sounds like a very bizarre idea. But if you look at say, things that we're afraid of, like viruses. These are invisible malevolent forces. And we take action to try to prevent them from hurting us. This is exactly the same view that they had. There are invisible malevolent forces trying to hurt us, and we have to take certain action to try to prevent that. Or if they do hurt us, to try to cure ourselves of, us, of this. So I would call it a kind of proto-scientific approach. And I would say that in the history of Jewish mysticism and magic, there are four kinds of Jewish magic. One is predictive magic, in other words, using certain techniques to try to predict the future. So if it's going to be good, you can take advantage of it. And if it's going to be bad, you can either mitigate the effect or avoid it altogether. And we have a whole industry in, in our co contemporary society, futurology, even weathermen, they're ultra and stock market analysts. They're, everybody's trying to predict the future for the same reasons that they were. Then you have preventative magic, taking, using certain techniques to try to prevent certain things from happening to you. An amulet can be used in, in this regard. It, it tries to keep certain evil forces away from you. I mean, that's why people take flu shots. It's kind of a modern form of an amulet to try to keep the viruses away from you. And what does a virus mean? A virus is, means it's in the air. It means it's invisible and it's malevolent. Then you have curative magic, which is the use of certain techniques to cure a person who has been adversely affected by some kind of evil force. And you use, say, potions, called today drugs, pharmaceuticals. You use charms, spells, amulets, folk medicine. Some of it not very unlike what we're using today. And then you have creative magic, the most prominent example being the creation of artificial life, uh, usually formed around the uh, legend of the golem. So I would say that you have all of this kind of magic within Jewish folklore and within Jewish mysticism. And um, in Jewish mysticism, you also have the idea of what they call the drawing down of the divine flow, called in Hebrew the shefa, the divine influx. In other words, there's good stuff up there. There's divine energy up there. And you want to draw it down to help you achieve your most material goals. In other words, the most spiritual thing in the universe, the flow of divine grace, if it's brought down to our world and channeled in the right direction, helps bring about the most material results, like, let's say, prosperity, 
fertility, safety, and uh, the creature, fulfillment of the creature needs. Shekhinah is one of the most important contributions of, of Kabbalah. It balances the patriarchal view of God. Right? God is described predominantly, almost exclusively, in masculine terms. In most of, in most of, Western, religious, in most of Western religious literature, God is seen as the, as the king, as the judge, as the ruler, as the warrior. And that masculine depiction of God, Kabbalah, is really offering a critique a theological critique and saying that this is an inadequate way to picture God. God should be seen as equally male and female. So in some ways the feminine depiction of God is emphasizing the more intimate side of God, God as mother, God as the constant companion of Israel. The other amazing thing about Shekhinah is that in some ways it's a in some ways it's a it's a recovery, a rediscovery of the ancient goddess. Of course, if we go back to the ancient Near East, we have many goddesses, Anat, Asherah, Astarte, just to speak of the Canaanite forms of the goddess. And we find in the Bible a, a very strong criticism of Canaanite fertility worship. The prophets are railing against the people because some of them are attracted to the Canaanite goddesses. But we know that there were Israelites who worshipped the goddess. There were even Israelites who tried to combine worship of the goddess with worship of the Hebrew God. For example, archaeologists have found material on which is written to yud and his Asherah, to God and his goddess. Now the Bible condemns this kind of syncretism, this com combining of of monotheism with, with paganism. And in later Judaism, you find hardly any references to the goddess. And yet in Kabbalah, the goddess re-emerges. You might say that the goddess has now been made kosher. And that, I think, is a startling, a startling development. It somehow, it, it shows, this shows that the, the feminine depiction of God had a strong hold on people and answer to a deep basic human need for God to be intimate and accessible and not just the, the ruler in heaven. This is how the Zohar interprets the opening words of Genesis. The Hebrew is Bereshit bara Elohim, which we usually translate in the beginning God created. But the Zohar insists on reading the words in the precise order in which they appear in Hebrew. Bereshit, in the beginning. Bara, it created. Elohim, God. In the beginning, it created God. The Zohar takes that to mean, in the beginning, infinity created God. Now what could that possibly mean? God is now the object of the verse, not the subject, which sounds impossible or heretical, but the Zohar, I think, is saying that infinity is the true reality of God. Anything else that we call God is puny compared to that. That's our own imagination or our own, our own estimate of what God could be. It doesn't do justice to the true reality of God. So infinity brought about all that we think of as God. And for the Zohar, that's the meaning of the opening of Genesis. In the beginning, infinity created what we call God. Well, the first thing to understand is that the Zohar is very concerned with Jewish practice. And the first set of secrets that it's concerned with are the secrets of why you do certain things the way you do them. Why you leave three little hairs sticking up from the base of your phylacteries, of your tefillin. Why you pour off a few drops of wine every time you recite the ten plagues at the Passover Seder. 
Small, inexplicable things are explained by the Zohar as having deeper meanings. In fact, both of those things that I mentioned are sacrifices to the demonic forces. The demonic forces, the forces of evil, want their, uh, want their piece of the pie. They want to dip their beaks in the religious practice, so to speak. And you give them a little something. When the Zohar presents its view of underlying reality, it definitely says that evil is to some degree separate from God. The forces of evil can work for God. They can be God's employees. They can also be simply obstructions, leftover materials from creation, like tripping over a beam or a brick on a building site. Something got left around and it served as an obstruction. But certainly there are forces of evil that are slightly different, and they do mischief. There were always demons and evil spirits in Talmudic Judaism. One of the most interesting ones was Lilit. Lilit was, according to the one rabbinic reading of the Bible, Adam's first wife. That is to say, the rabbis taught, the woman in Genesis 1 is not the same woman in Genesis 2. The woman in Genesis 1 is Lilit. The woman in Genesis 2 is Eve. Eve is not the same as Lilit. Lilit left Adam, got tired of him, and went off to become the queen of the demonesses. She is the queen of nocturnal emission and crib death. And as a popular amulet, uh, there are amulets sold to protect infants from Lilit. She's also become a feminist icon in liberal Judaism, which is an odd thing. You can walk down the streets of a Jewish neighborhood, walk into a conservative temple and find a copy of Lilit magazine, which is the magazine of Jewish feminism, and then you can walk across the street to a Jewish bookstore in Los Angeles, in St. Louis, wherever, and buy an amulet to put in your child's crib to protect them from Lilit. The most ancient idea is that God has multiple names, and these names have power. Already from the time of the Talmud, there were secret names of God, and these names never left Kabbalah. Eventually, invoking these names was seen as a way to protect yourself from evil forces. Many Jews of the, the last generations used to wear a little mezuzah, a little gold amulet around their neck with the basic Jewish prayer, the Shema, in it now. There's no commandment to wear a mezuzah around your neck. Uh, what it is is, in prior generations, they had worn amulets around their necks to protect them, to gain uh, uh, a spouse for them, to protect them from disease, to ward off evil. These amulets were based in sacred names. The idea that there's a dichotomy between the body and the soul really began in the Talmud, in the Midrash. And they said that there are in fact five names for the soul. And Jewish philosophy began to employ three of these, saying that there's a lowest part of the soul that dwells in the gravesite. There's an emotional soul that goes and lives with God in heaven when people die. And there's a transcendent soul, a spark of God that dissolves back into God when a person dies. Therefore, a person's soul really has three parts, the physical soul, the emotional soul, which has gone to live in the celestial garden of Eden with God, and the transcendent divine soul, which dissolves back into God. Now, from this came an interesting set of practices to Kabbalah. That is, first of all, the highest part of the soul in order to dissolve back into God takes at least a year to rise up to God, and it requires a lot of help. So from the Zohar, among other sources, came the idea that the mourner has to recite a certain prayer called the Kaddish, in which God's name is sanctified. And the recitation of that prayer, once a day, three times a day, once a week, whatever they can manage, will help push that highest level of the soul back to God. At the same time, the grave site, the graveyard, 
really contains the lowest level of the soul. So if a person goes to visit the grave, that's not a simple emotional thing to do. There is a meaning to going to the grave. The soul of the deceased lives there. And if they're the soul of a very great saint, then their soul has great mobility. If you pray there, that prayer will be transmitted to the lower soul, which is still connected to the emotional soul, which is still connected to the transcendent soul, which has dissolved into God. So that is a place to go to pray. That is an acupuncture point of spirituality. Or if you have a deceased relative, somebody who cared about you, an elderly grandparent, let's say, and you pray at their grave, they will take the trouble to communicate that message to God. So graveyards became positive places to the mystics, particularly in Svat. And Svat is dotted with graves going back to the Hellenistic period that have great meaning and are pilgrimage sites. One of the great Svat rituals was the rite, the cult, shall I say, of the Shekhinah and the cult of the divine marriage. Now, people don't really think about this when they go to temple in America and rise at the end of a certain hymn and bow and sing, Come, O Bride, Come, O Bride. But in fact, the Svat Kabbalists viewed the Friday night service and meal as a wedding feast when the divine parts of God above unified with the earthly feminine aspect of God in the world, the Shekhinah, and they had sexual union on Friday night. And this has survived into general Jewish practice to this day. Avraham Abulafia was born in 1240 in Saragossa, and then he peregrinated actually almost all his life to Tudela, to Italy, to Greece, to Akko in the land of Israel, back to Greece, back to Italy, back to Spain, again back to Greece, back to Italy, and then in Sicily where he apparently died in 1291. So that's a very intense, uh, uh, what's called an itinerant scholar or an errant scholar. He did it because uh, he was in search for other types, types of knowledge than regular. I mean, he moved from one center of culture to another and attempted to absorb and to offer synthesis between different forms of knowledge he learned. Basically, he started as a philosopher, and then he started to study Kabbalah, and he offered a synthesis between Jewish philosophy, what's called Maimonides, in between Hasidic Ashkenaz, the Lazaro forms, which is much more magical, much more ling linguistically oriented. So he started with the Greek form of knowledge, Maimonidian philosophy, which is basically Aristotle, and then he combined it with a theory which is totally different, which has to do with the power of language, which is rejected by Maimonides, rejected by Aristotle. So he offered a powerful synthesis between two forms of Jewish culture. The Andalusian one, Maimonides, and the German one, which is Hasidic Ashkenaz. So that, the broader picture is that two cultures, totally different, in clash, were brought together by someone who studied both of them in his youth, and around the age of 31, he came with a synthesis, which he attempted to disseminate in all the southern part of Europe. He did it because he believed that he is a prophet. That's the way to achieve prophecy. And he believed that he is a prophet. And even more so because he believed that he is the Messiah. So it was part of his messianic enterprise, which means that he believed the Messianist was not just someone coming and bringing the Jews out of exile to a certain place. Hardly he believed it. He believed that Messianism is teaching people how to rescue themselves from their body, from their exile in the matter, in the body, which that is for him real redemption. 
So for him, the theories that I'm going to elaborate about are not just mystical techniques. They are ways to reach ecstasy, which, which he calls prophecy, which is a redemptive experience. So he believes that if he's going to teach all the people in the world, Jews or non-Jews, he is going to be the Messiah. He will save them. That doesn't mean it's going to happen in the same year. That is maybe an accumulative process. But for him, that was messianism. So his assumption is that he can bring together the idea of intellectual perfection from Maimonides with a technique, how to achieve it instantly from a Lazaro forms. That's why he wrote commentaries on Maimonides' book. On the other side, he wrote commentaries on Sefer Itzira, a book that is very dear to Lazaro forms. And Maimonides never mentioned it, he rejected it basically implicitly. So he attempted actually to capitalize on the two most important medieval achievements in the generation before him. So he offered a technique which has two different, how to put it, aspects. One is how, by combining letters, someone is deconstructing the normal consciousness and in such a way he's able to open his consciousness to another form of experience, which means that by reciting letters of the divine name and letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which are meaningless, someone is in a way deconstructing the notions he believes in, or his worldview. Magic and the use of amulets as expressing it uh, was a part of the Jewish people from time immemorial. And even before the Kabbalah became uh, a, a discipline, as it were, sometime in the 12th century, as it's normally figured. Um, it's dealt with in the Talmud, and we have documentation from the Cairo Geniza of earlier documents having to do with magic. Um, but today, nonetheless, all of these things are called practical Kabbalah. Uh, even though some of them have histories going back to the pre-Kabbalistic period, nonetheless, today, the idea of magic and Kabbalah on a practical level are considered one and the same. I think that amulets in the post-Kabbalah period or in the Kabbalistic period stretching up until now, and those in the pre-Kabbalah period really were made for the same uses. At least up until a hundred years ago, from my own personal experience, the vast majority of amulets were birth amulets. And I think that would have been true in the ancient period as well. Birth was a really traumatic experience for the whole family, particularly for the woman and the child. And as we well know, until modern medicine found solutions for some of the problems that came with birth, the percentage of children and women who died was, was horrendous. Uh, I, I know from some statistic in France that something on the order of 25 or 30 percent of children didn't make it until their second or third year of life. So in times when people pass through traumas that their science for whatever development it was at the time doesn't have an answer, they reach for other answers, and those answers generally come in the more mystical traditions. Some of the most famous Kabbalist rabbis, such as the Chida, Chaim David Yosef Azulai, uh, would write amulets, and these were considered to have particular, particularly strong efficacy because they were written by somebody who was so conversant with the Kabbalah. Um, I think that the whole idea of the, well, an another good example would be the, the 
the scroll of the spheres, which for many years was a highly esoteric theoretical attempt to present visually for greater understanding of the Kabbalistic world. Uh, towards the end of the 19th century, um, people began to write this, a shortened version of these Kabbalistic scrolls in a small form, just a, a couple of inches across and maybe a foot or two feet long, which would be rolled up and put in a silver tube, and it became amulitic. It lost all its relationship to theoretical Kabbalah, but of course stemmed directly from it, and the amulitic power of this amulet, which was a general protective amulet, stemmed from the fact that it was the theoretical world of Kabbalah reduced to a small piece that they could carry along with them in a silver tube. After the, the settlement and the development in 16th century Tzfat and 17th century Tzfat, where Kabbalah became such a strong discipline and influence on really the whole of the Jewish people, I think it spread out tremendously. And, and we know that there was a battle with normative rabbinic Judaism, which was won by rabbinic Judaism, but they, I think, won it to no small degree by incorporating many of the elements of Kabbalistic prayer. We have prayers, we have hymns, particularly uh, before, on, before Shabbat, uh, that are a regular part of, of the prayer book today that we don't think about as Kabbalistic anymore. So it clearly had a big, big influence. The, the fact that many of these rabbis would write amulets and that gave an added power to those amulets, I think connected Kabbalah to the people and began to engender this idea that magic is an offshoot of Kabbalah. We know that magic was around for at least 1,500 years before Kabbalah began as a discipline. But in modern interpretation, I think it's almost parallel between Kabbalah on one side and practical magic and amulets on the other. I think that one of the interesting aspects about Kabbalah, which is very little explored, is the visual aspect. Uh, academics in Kabbalah deal with the philosophical and spiritual building of a world as drawn by Kabbalah and really never relate to the visual aspect that is put down in manuscripts and in books. And this can be from the portrayal of the spheres, which you can see in the scrolls, which are aesthetically extremely attractive in many cases, to Kabbalistic prayer books, where there is a whole system of a kavanot, of, of, of of meaning and significance in the way that the words are laid out on the page that is incredibly beautiful, and we can see examples of that as well. Uh, and it's an aspect that I find incredibly attractive, even to the portrayal of figures of, of both the evil spirits and angels in Kabbalistic uh, uh, books that portray, that were made by the makers of amulets. So that's an aspect that I think deserves much more study and is one of the things that people find extremely attractive in addition to the whole idea of mysticism today. Distracting the ego is turning the will to receive into, will to receive is the ego, is the egoistic will. Yes, and destroying it is becoming divine. Now, this is an Ashlagian Kabbalistic theme, but that fits very well New Age ideas of constructing, also constructing, fighting, combating the ego, ego see, seen as something superficial and, superficial, uh, uh, and finding the inner self, inner divine self. So here, then, there's a new age interpretation of Kabbalah, but it's based on a Kabbalistic theme that appears 
previous to, uh, to this new, new age interpretation. Kabbalah Center annoys almost everyone. Uh, there's various levels, and of course, one is appropriating, saying that they, uh, you know, they, they're in charge. If this, they, they do represent a very radical interpretation of Kabbalah, which is perceived as sacred to many Orthodox Jews, who perceive Kabbalah in a very different way. For them, teaching Kabbalah to Gentiles, for instance, that's a red line that shouldn't be crossed. The popularization of Kabbalah, again, is something that's very, uh, uh, very offensive to many uh, Orthodox rabbis, and because of that, there's quite a, a polemical uh, uh, struggle uh, uh, against them. Academics are also usually uh, quite against them. Again, after uh, teaching Kabbalah and studying Kabbalah for many years, etc., there's come this group and. Uh, targets more or less the same kind of audience and offers them. I think there is a struggle of possession of Kabbalistic knowledge, who's in the possession of interpreting it and explaining its worth and, and, uh, and uh, significance to the modern world. As a scholar, I don't think we should get into this uh, struggle. We should try to understand things uh, and not be part of it. But I think some of the academics are very opposed because they would say, this is not the Kabbalah. What they're teaching as Kabbalah is not the Kabbalah of the 13th century. Now, for me, that is obvious. Of course it's not, because of that it was inter it's so interesting. If it would be the Kabbalah of the 13th century, it would be a significant uh, a cultural phenomena. But trying to appropriate Kabbalah to the th 21st century and succeeding in that, that is what I think as a historian of culture, of Jewish uh, uh, history, etc., uh, uh, that, that's what I find uh, fascinating. And I think that's what Kabbalists always did, because also Luria, Isaac Luria in the 16th century didn't represent the Zoharic ideas, he appropriated them to the 16th century audience. And that is what Kabbalah Center and many other groups, Bnei Baruch, other groups are doing, and they're doing it very successfully. And I find it uh, fascinating and interesting and really legitimate, if there is such a thing of legitimacy in these issues, as continuing the tradition of Kabbalah, taking things from tradition, and appropriating and explaining them in a way that is significant to people in their own time. The text starts by <laughs> stating that God created the world with 32 paths of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And the 32 paths are defined as 10 sefirot associated with numbers and 22 Hebrew letters. And ten sefirot in the text are ex explained as the past and the future. That's the time dimension. The space dimension has six directions, east, west, north, south, up and down. And then the, the spiritual human mind-body dimension is good and evil how we choose between good and evil. So that's the 10. And then there's 22 Hebrew letters that are divided into three groups, three mother letters, seven double letters, and 12 simple letters. And these numbers three, seven, and 12 are explained in terms of time and space and that spiritual human dimension. The three mother letters, they're expressed in, in time as fire, water, and air. Fire is like the hot season, water is the cold season, and then the air is the temperate season. So throughout the year, it's divided into three seasons. In space, it's the heavens is fire, the earth is water, and the atmosphere is air. And the human body, the head is associated with fire, the belly with water, and the chest with air. The seven um, in time are associated with the seven days of the week. In space are associated with the seven planets that we can see with the naked eye. 
and the seven openings of the senses, the two ears, the two eyes, the two nostrils, and the mouth. A lot of Kabbalah has to do with the Messianic uh, idea. And the Zohar speaks about the Messianic era as taking place in the sixth, the end of the sixth millennium, preparing for the seventh millennium. And this has to do with uh, the Jewish calendar. And the Jewish calendar starts with Adam. And the first, the first two millennia take us from Adam to Abraham. According to the Jewish calendar, Abraham was, was born in 1948 of the, the Jewish calendar. And then the third millennia and the fourth millennia was a time that the, the Torah, the books of the Old Testament were, were formed, and also the Talmud. Mm -hmm. The fifth millennium in entirety, the Jewish people were in, were in exile, and they had a tradition that the redemption would happen at the sunrise of the, of the sixth millennium. Now, this has to do also with uh, the appearance of the Zohar at the, the end of the 13th century. If you want me to talk a little bit about, about this idea of the sixth millennium, I think it's important to understand. Um, one of the, the services in, in Judaism is receiving the Shabbat on Friday afternoon. So the, nights, the, the day starts with the night. It says it was evening and it was morning one, one day. So Shabbat starts in, in the evening. And the service of, of receiving the Shabbat was developed here in Tzfat. So it's not just receiving the seventh day. It's about receiving the seventh millennium. So the sixth millennium starts in the Hebrew year 5000, which is 1240 um, CE. And the Zohar appears something like 12, 1290 in, in Spain. So that's like the stars coming out on Thursday night, the beginning of the, the sixth millennium. So if we fast forward from there 250 years, so it takes us to midnight of the sixth millennium. And that's the year 1490. So a lot of changes happen in the world from 1240 to, to 1490. One of them is the expulsion of the Jews from, from Spain, and that's when Columbus was sent and he discovered uh, a whole other part of, of, of the world. There was a shift from thinking ab about the world as flat to thinking of it as, as round. It was the beginning of the, the Renaissance, or the Renaissance was happening. Galileo was at that, uh, at that time as well. Im important changes in, in the world. And that's when Kabbalah w became very popular in, in Sfat. The Zohar was first published in the middle of, of the 16th century. So the Kabbalists in, in Sfat had not just manuscripts available, but actual printed texts. And that was the midnight of the sixth, sixth millennium. The Zohar teaches that the rooster crows at midnight announcing the dawn. So the spreading of the teachings of, of a Kabbalah, which is about how to align one's soul and um, become inspired. It's about returning to prophecy. So the teachings of the Kabbalah is about bringing back inspiration to a people that has been suffering in exile for, for, for many years. So the spreading of the, the teachings was about to prepare for the Messianic era. The Zohar can be explained in terms of Sefirot in a more general sense, but Lurianic Kabbalah is primarily about part Sufim, and it's about um, using the metaphor of family as for, for Tikkun Olam. 
uh, repairing the world. The idea is that if we, we see God in our own image, and just like we are both masculine and feminine, young and old, so we see God in, in Kabbalah, there's visions of God in, in Kabbalah as both young and old, both masculine and, and, and feminine. And just like the dynamics that we have with our family, sometimes they're broken and sometimes we repair. So it's a metaphor for the, the entire universe, that there's bro broken aspects of the universe and it's a part of our, our job to, to repair that brokenness. So if we can heal the, the breaks in our, in our family and then extend that outward to our community, to our nation, and ultimately to, to the entire world, this is the process that human beings and, and God are engaged as a, as a partnership in repairing the world.